Dr. Scott Uhall here with another Tuesday afternoon virtual coffee chat. I want to thank everybody for showing up today and I think we got a good topic today. We're going to talk about body composition and its influence on chronic disease. This is the third part of our uh, Taking Charge of Chronic Disease series through uh, behavioral habits and lifestyle change. So I want to thank everyone for being here today and talk about um, everything that we've got going on today. So I'm going to define what body composition is uh, and how it's measured. And then we're going to talk about factors that influence body composition, how you gain, gain weight, lose weight, and then the health risks associated with a poor body composition. And then some of the behavioral and lifestyle factors that we can do to uh, make sure that we have a healthful body composition. Cause that's, it's really, really important uh, to our long-term health and helping to fight chronic disease. So we've got another quarter hour of wellness power coming up. I want to say thanks again um, to Kangaroo Coffee for sponsoring our virtual coffee chat. And it's a little nippy out there today. So go ahead and get yourself a nice hot cup of coffee uh, and enjoy that. So as usual, just want to quickly differentiate between a medical doctor an MD or a DO, and myself, a PhD in health promotion. Medical doctors, again, um, they use tertiary care, they use pharmaceutical drugs, uh, follow-up treatments, and so on to help manage people's uh, health issues. Whereas me, uh, I try to use lifestyle change and behavior change to help prevent uh, or even retard long-term chronic disease. So, yeah, we're both trying to help each other out. We just go about it in a little bit different way. So, um, with that, we've got our usual disclaimer, all right, and um, want to make sure that everyone gets their annual physical. Uh, if you're here on the Phil Long um, health care plan, you can get all that done at one of our care here clinics. There's no charge. So make sure you get that annual physical with blood work. You can actually get a reduction uh, in your health care premium uh, if you're on the Phil Long plan for doing so. And also, you can identify um, chronic disease or disease at, at a much earlier state if you get that annual physical more so than wait around for symptoms to show up and then go get that medical care. So like I said, always get your annual physical and it's really good for your health. So what exactly is body composition? Well, to find it, it's really an assessment done to determine uh, the percentage of lean body mass that you have. And lean body mass is made up of protein, minerals, body water, versus subcutaneous body fat. And that's the body fat that sits right underneath your skin, but above your muscle. And it's measured in a number of ways. You've probably seen the body mass index. That's a real common parameter that you see. It's in the newspaper. And if you know somebody's weight in kilograms and their height in meters squared, um, you do a little division, you can see that equation there. And there's how you get your body mass index. The problem with body mass index though, is it does not differentiate between lean body mass, muscle if you will, and body fat, and we're gonna show you here in the slide coming up, there's a huge differences between the two types of tissue. So therefore, although body mass uh, index does give you a value, it's really not um, the best assessment that's out there. Probably the next step up, and if any of y'all have a home scale where you step on the scale and you can determine your body composition, they use a, a concept called bioelectrical impedance where they shoot a very low uh, frequency of electricity through your body and being that there's differences in the amount of water between lean body mass and body fat, the current travels through those tissues at a different rate and the speed at which it travels, it allows bioelectrical impedance to make an estimate of your body composition. The problem with that though is that if you're not properly hydrated um, or you're very lean, uh, the result can become very inaccurate. So if you drink a lot of coffee, uh, you might have gone out the night before and drank a couple of drinks. Uh, if you're not hydrated, and about 50% of America walks around in a dehydrated state on a regular basis, um, that result can be uh, wrong. The one that I use, it's probably the best, uh, most common, uh, most accurate, easily done, is called skinfold calipers. And you can see that as an example there on the top right hand picture. Uh, they're doing a skinfold test uh, on the tricep on the back of that gentleman's arm. And you can measure a few places on a body and you can come up with a value that's very, very close to the gold standard of measuring body composition, which is called hydrostatic weighing. And you can see a picture of that on the bottom. 
Um, looking at that picture, though, it's kind of cumbersome. You got to stick your head underwater. There's an awful lot of additional things you have going. So most people won't have access to hydrostatic weight. And so I recommend skinfold calipers. That's what we use here at Phil Long to measure your body composition. So before we get into that, let me just kind of share you some interesting facts between um, adipose tissue and, and muscle mass or lean body tissue. But muscle is about 70% water. Uh, body fat has roughly 10%. And one thing I want to point out, a lot of times people talk about, hey, I'm trying this new diet. Man, it's the first week I've lost 10 pounds or I've lost 12 pounds, but it's okay. It's water weight. You know, well, actually it's not okay because it's water weight. Because the reality is, even though you've lost 10 pounds or so in a week, and I do not recommend losing that amount of weight in a week, it's way too much. Two to three pounds is, is what I would shoot for. But most of that water weight that you're losing, believe it or not, is coming from your muscle mass. And even though you've lost 10 or 12 pounds, your body composition is actually at a worse ratio than what it was before. Well, we want to lose weight, but we want to lose it from body fat, not lean body mass. And that can occur as a result of a number of different things that we do. Now, skeletal muscle or muscle has got a metabolic ratio. It's almost 10 times greater metabolic need than body fat does. It doesn't take a whole lot of energy to keep body fat alive, but it does take an awful lot um, of body fat excuse me, a lot of, a lot of uh, energy to keep muscle alive. So um, keep that in mind because I want to talk about uh, this concept, uh, what I call skinny fat. And what that really is, and it's due to a lot of um, eating patterns and physical activity patterns, but you end up with a disproportionate amount of fat to lean body mass, even though an individual's weight is appropriate for their height. They're, they're under muscular, if you will, and they've got extra body fat. So that's where that skinny fat term comes from. And it's a lot more common than what you think. And people that have this, there's really no symptoms of it, but uh, you have a slow metabolism. You're fatigued a lot. You've got malaise. You just kind of feel tired all the time. And there's a frailness to you where, you know, you're easily injured. Uh, you get tired a lot. You pull muscles easy. And it's all kind of as a result of our eating and um, our dietary habits and our physical activity. So one last thing I want to point out, when you start to work out, commonly you don't lose weight at first. And the reason for that being is that you're probably putting on some muscle and losing a little bit of fat. And as you can see in the picture here, all other things being equal, muscle takes up about, it's much more dense. And so it takes up significantly less space for the same amount of weight that you can see there. So uh, don't uh, don't get concerned if you start a fitness program where you're exercising lifting weights and you don't lose weight right away that's that's all right that's normal that's to be expected increasing your muscle mass will help with your weight loss farther on down the road now here's some examples here's uh, some some quantifiers of of your body composition and there's a little bit of a difference between men and women uh, women um, can raise children they can uh, they can be pregnant and bear children. And so there's a difference. There's a lot of estrogens, fat-based hormones that are uh, related to uh, pregnancy. And so there's a difference between men and women. And you can see there, uh, essential body fat for women is about 13%. For men, it's much less than that. Uh, for athletic performance, you can see the values there, roughly up to 20% for women, up to 13% for men. Fitness standards, again, you can see those. Now, I want to talk about this acceptable value here. When you get between 21 and, excuse me, 25 and 31 or 18 and 24 for a man, you're starting to get a little bit of weight on you. Um, and something you should consider maybe to try to get that down. Because once you get to 32% of your body composition is body fat or 25% for a man, uh, then that's a significant health risk. It's just like having high cholesterol or high blood pressure. You're carrying around. Um, a significant amount of body fat that it's harmful to your long-term health. And that's what chronic disease is all about. So take a look at some of these values of uh, adults 20 and over with obesity here in the United States, it's almost at 40%. And then those that are overweight or obese, it's almost 72%. So talk about a pandemic across America. We've got a, a pandemic of poor body composition here in the United States. And I don't think that there's any single reason that brings that on. Um, I don't think people wake up 
to have low or poor body compositions. But since the 1980s and so on, we've had a major increase in uh, problems with our body composition, as you can see from this slide here. In 1980s, you can see it's pretty much white and light blue, which means roughly less than 14% of the population per state has that. In 2000, you can see the dark blue. Colorado is the, the one light blue state in there. In fact, Colorado, from a body composition standard, we're the fittest state in the nation. But even now, in, in 2020, about 23% of our population has a bad body composition value. You can see in 2010, it's significantly worse, uh, especially in the Southwest, uh, in Southeast, excuse me, and it's kind of prevalent. So again, there's no single reason for this, but I think there's a number of them. Uh, we're less active than we are now. We're working a lot more in these little bitty cubicles. Uh, we have more fast food choices. We actually eat out dinner about 50% of the time now, where in the 70s, we only ate out about 10 or 15% of the time. So there's a lot going on there and it's influencing our health, but unfortunately not in a good way. Here's kind of where we sit right now. Uh, Colorado and the, the, the District of Columbia where Washington DC is, we're the only ones that are in the less than 25% range. And you can see that it's, it's all over the United States again, in the Southeast, the Midwest, we got a lot going on there. And like I said, again, having a high or a poor body composition is a risk factor for uh, chronic disease, just like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, family history, and so on. So we really, we really need to look at this body composition situation from a health perspective because it's 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 influencing our long-term quality of life. Now, what influences body composition? Well, genetics obviously plays a part. Uh, we talked in a previous coffee chat about the endomorph, the mesomorph, and the ectomorph and um, the, the genetic relationships that you get from that. And that, that does, that comes right from your parents. And those influence um, 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 our metabolism and so on. And again, we, we talked about that before, so we won't touch on it too much today. But we've got a bunch of environmental factors like fast food options. I mean, like I said, 50% of the time we eat out now. Uh, the in and out burgers come into town, so there's going to be another influential uh, environmental factor. Um, we got a lot of man-made carbs out there. We're getting inundated with commercials to eat stuff. I, I think Reese's right now is doing the Halloween candy thing. Get your Reese's peanut butter cup, but eat it before you give it to your kids. I mean, all that stuff's going on. It's influencing our health. There are certain drugs that influence our health, uh, thyroid-based drugs. There are some statin drugs that do that uh, socioeconomically. Um, socioeconomic status of those of uh, lower income levels have a higher rate of um, poor body compositions. That could be lack of access to health care, lack of access to quality food choices. Like I said, a number of things. We really can't put our finger on what's going on, but something is going on. We do know that lifestyle choice is a significant contributor to, to low or poor body compositions. And that's from the food choices that we have. You know, not only how and what we eat, um, but the amount of fat in the diet, our fitness habits or lack thereof, stress management and how we do that. Cortisol is a, a big precursor to putting midsection body fat on it, poor sleep habits. And these are all things that we've talked about in a prior chat. Uh, but again, uh, when you put them together synergistically, uh, they cause a lot more influence than individual variables of themselves. And then that can lead to that chronic disease we're talking about. Look at this picture here. We got the same person. They got the same weight, 180 pounds. But the person has a BMI on the left of 24, in the middle 29, and on the right 35. And you can see that with the BMI, they just get more massive. We don't know if they're putting on more muscle or fat. We just know that there's more mass there. And once you get above 25 BMI for a man and 30 for a female, that's considered a health risk. Um, I still like the skin fold caliper better than doing that. Um, but again, BMI, it's, it's easily accessible and we can get a result from there. Now, there are a lot of health risks. I mentioned that about poor body composition. The leading cause of death is heart attack and body composition is highly correlated to that. You can see it's almost two, almost, uh, two thirds 
647,000 deaths. Uh, cancer, second leading cause of death, colorectal cancer, breast cancer. We just talked about that last week. All of these are, have a high correlation to uh, individuals with poor body compositions. Strokes, diabetes, um, these are all lifestyle diseases in the top 10. And when you add these together, it represents about 43% of all the deaths in America. And there's a high correlation to having poor body composition with this. Now, there are a bunch of other chronic diseases related to body composition, like arthritis, dementia, um, but they don't necessarily kill you like these other ones do. They just ruin, uh, discern or make your quality of life a little bit less. So what can we do to improve this? Well, again, take a look at this guy on the right. He did a science project on himself a number of years ago. I can't remember his name. Um, but on May 7th, he started eating really bad food and he gained a bunch of weight up to November 5th. And then he went back on um, a diet, if you will, and he lost all that weight back. And what I want to say is there's a science to body composition. You know, it's not easy uh, and the body can only respond to how it's treated. But there is a method to influence your body composition. And we've got a great program for you here at Phil on if you'd like to get involved with that. Just give me a call and we can help with the body composition. But really, in a nutshell, I'll tell you six things. Try to eat regularly, evenly spaced meals throughout the day. Don't skip meals. Stay well hydrated. Drink water. We talked about the plant-based diets. Try to get that, get the antioxidant-rich foods that go along with that, your fruits and vegetables. Get your quality proteins. Try to uh, try really hard not to overeat. I think that's really bad. It causes oxidative stress. And we've talked about some of that in the past. Um, under eating is also stressful. Try to minimize your white carbs. Those are your man-made carbs that we've talked about. Animal products, I'm not saying don't eat them, but just you know, try to be uh, cognizant of that. Because again, red meat is probably the best place to get all of your essential amino acids, which is related to protein. I highly uh, recommend limiting alcohol, sugary drinks, energy drinks, and so on. Um, just there's not a lot of cal uh, nutritional value there, just a lot of calories. Try to maintain good physical health. We talked about the five components of fitness earlier, flexibility, muscular strength, endurance, body composition, and cardiovascular health. Really focus on those and your body composition will be just fine. Try to manage stress well. We talked about cortisol. And again, excessive cortisol release really promotes midsection body fat storage. And you see a lot of that going on in America. And then get good quality sleep if you can. Six to eight hours is what you need. You need that get into that REM sleep, rapid eye movement, so your body and your mind can recover. And if you're only getting four hours of sleep or using medication to help you sleep, you really don't get into that, that, um, that REM sleep. And again, uh, talking about stress, make sure you get those you stressful uh, things in your life, not just the distressful ones. So um, have a lot going on there. Uh, one thing I want to say, we've got some upcoming events. Uh, next week, I got a really great special guest, uh, Dr. David Greenberg. I've known him for years. He's a cardiologist here in town. Uh, he works with Kaiser Permanente. And he's going to talk to us about uh, cardiovascular and heart health using Life's Simple 7. It's a, a great program to follow. And if you do that, your likelihood of getting cardiovascular disease in your lifetime is greatly diminished. Um, a couple of other things, diabetes, vitamin deficiencies coming up. Another special guest, Mike Mazzola uh, from the Energy Resource Center is going to share us with some, some great things to get us a healthy home. And I want to take a minute and say thank you very much to all of the participants that did the Susan G. Komen more than Pink Walk. We had 160 plus get registered and get some steps in. And the Phil Long Rock and Ribbons, we came in first place. So pat yourself on the back for our corporate fundraising. And we had more steps as a group than any other in the Southern Colorado District. So thank you very much for your participation in that from the Corporate Communication Department. Gina Sacrapani, Will Dillinger, Randy Gratishar, and yours truly. Um, but once again, thank you for showing up to the, today's virtual coffee chat. I know I went a little bit over. I think I had some really good information because body composition, I know it's a sensitive subject, but if you don't take care of it, it can really harm your long-term health. So as usual, if you have a chat that you'd like for us to discuss and talk about, please send that to me. 
uh, at my email, and I'll see you next week at the same virtual coffee chat time and the same virtual coffee chat channel. So I'll talk to you next week. Goodbye, everybody, and thanks for your time.